And now may we hear the word of God as it's found in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We shall begin our reading with verse 6, the inspired word of the living God. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And may God speak to us this day, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Even now the echoes of Christmas are slowly fading away. The twinkling star has disappeared entirely and the angelic chorus now is merely a faint reverberation over the distant Judean hills. And even the rustle of departing angels' wings is but a memory. While here at home, having ripped off the ribbons and the wrappings and opened the boxes, and looked at the ties and perfumes and plastic aliens and other modern gifts. I wonder how many people have looked down at the debris all around their feet and have wondered in their hearts, is that all there is to Christmas? Well, I would like to address that question today through a parable that I constructed years ago. Jesus was the master teacher and he spun parables as easily as a silkworm spins silk. But a parable is not an easy thing to spin, I have discovered. A parable, of course, is a great spiritual truth clothed in physical garb. Jesus wove them masterfully, and he indeed clothed the minds of his hearers with them unforgettably and moved their hearts. Well, 30 years ago, I decided to try to craft a parable of my own about Christmas, a modern parable of Christmas, if you will. And it turns out to be the most frequently requested message that I have ever preached. I've called it Mary Tifton. Some have wanted me to preach it every Christmas season that I have demurred from, but I have given it about once every six years, and today is one of those times. As I thought about the parables that Jesus gave, he used the things that were all around him and were familiar to the people to whom he was speaking. They lived in an agrarian economy, and so he talked about the sheep and the goats and the wheat and the tares and the good soil and the bad and the son who left the father's farm and went off into a far country and those unforgettable parables. And I thought, well, most Americans wouldn't know a sheep from a goat. But what are they familiar with? And obviously, the answer came back. It was television, 
there's anything that Americans know well, it's TV. And about that time, there was a very popular program on called The Millionaire. Now, it's been off the air for many years. So I'll try to let you understand what it was, but I have taken that, adapted it, taken some liberties, and used it to present a modern parable of Christmas. Long ago and in a land far away, there lived a man named John Beersforth Tifton, a man whose teeming wealth was vast beyond the dreams of avarice, a man who had a most unusual habit. It was indeed strikingly strange. He had the custom of every now and again selecting by some inscrutable criteria known only to him certain individuals and bestowing upon them a gift of one million dollars. Beyond that, he also adopted them into his family, gave them his name of Tifton, and made them his heirs. Now, of course, this had enormous transforming effects upon the individuals who were the recipients of the gift. Now, this was done by his secretary, a gentleman by the name of Michael Anthony, easily recognized by the bowler hat, the umbrella under the arm, and the suitcase in his hand, which contained within it the cashier's check for one million dollars. Now, first there were just a few dozen, and then scores and hundreds, and finally thousands. And Mr. Tifton had left instruction in his will that out of this vast holdings of his estate, this custom was to be continued. And so over the years and several centuries that passed, literally thousands, tens of thousands of people around the world became all unexpectedly the recipients of the gift. Now, as one might expect, Back in his native land, many of those had received the gift and also the name of Tifton got together and they thought there must be some way that they could honor and remember their generous benefactor. So they decided to celebrate his birthday. And that they did. They wrote books and articles they sang songs which they had composed about this great benefactor, about his munificence that transformed their lives. They even came up with Tifton cards, which told about this wonderful man with various paintings and likenesses of him. Well, this continued on for many, many years. And then one day something happened that, that was going to change it forever. And it happened right here in America. You see, some Tiftons were discussing the Tifton Eve party that they were going to have that night when a couple of non-Tifton Americans overheard them and being great party crashers such as we are, they decided that they'd just sort of slip right in and enjoy the party. And so they did. And they heard all of this talking about someone named John Beersforth Tifton. And they picked up little pieces, snippets of the story that he obviously was a generous man that gave various gifts to people. They thought, well, probably, you know, ties and handkerchiefs and toiletries and shirts and pajamas and and uh, that seemed like a good idea. And they told their friends about the party the next day. And they told others. And they told others. It seemed like a wonderful idea. After all, his birthday did come in the middle of the winter. And that was a rather dreary time. And, and this would be something that would brighten up 
the dreary winter months. And so, first thing you know, everybody was celebrating Tifton Day. Why, they made it a national holiday right here in America. They even had Tifton trees. Of course, the fact that those trees didn't even grow in the land that Mr. Tifton lived in didn't bother them in the least. And so it went on until one day a couple of the real Tiftons from Mr. Tifton's native land were on a trip to America and they land right in New landed in New York Harbor on the afternoon of Tifton Eve. And they said one to them to the other, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could find another Tifton here in America to celebrate Tifton Eve with? They said, but that's not likely. This is such a big city. I doubt we could find even one so quickly. And to their amazement and their wondering eyes, as they're walking down the street, they looked into a department store window, and there was a sign that said, Tifton Specials, 50% off. And they said, marvelous, we have found a brother. And they were amazed to see that the name of the department store was named after someone named Macy. Why he hadn't named it after himself, Tifton, they, they couldn't quite understand. But they decided to make his acquaintance, and they went in, and just as they started to go in the door, they heard someone across the street call out, Mary Tifton! And they turned to try to find this person, and they heard someone on their side of the street respond with Mary Tifton, and first thing you know, there was a whole chorus of voices saying, Mary Tifton! Mary Tifton! and a happy new year. And they were dumbfounded. Why, Mr. Tifton has been extraordinarily generous to these people in America. We've never seen anything like this anywhere else. And they asked somebody about it and they said, oh, you're strangers. Well, we're having a Tifton Eve party at such and such a address, why don't you come tonight? You can learn all about our custom. And so they did. It was a large home, and the party was well underway when they arrived. There were scores of people there. There was a band playing rather too loudly, they thought. There was the tinkling of glasses. There was dancing and drinking and laughter and Several people were staggering around as if they were drunk, and they wondered, now, Mr. Tifton would not have approved of this kind of conduct. They couldn't understand it. And they decided that they would try to find out from some of these guests. And so they went up to one man, having marveled among themselves at what they had seen, especially that afternoon, they said, did you notice some of the people that were shouting Mary Tifton? Why, why some of them, why they didn't look like millionaires at all. They looked, they looked like, like paupers. Well, I didn't want to say anything, but you're absolutely right, brother. They did. Let's ask this fellow here. Excuse me, sir. I wonder if you could help us. We were just noticing these Tifton cards here on your mantle, and uh, we noticed that most of them don't even say anything about Mr. Tifton, and we were wondering about this big fat man in a green suit uh, in a chariot pulled by reindeer. We know there aren't any reindeer in Mr. Tifton's land. We can't understand this at all. Could you help us? Said, oh, you're strangers. I don't understand. Well, let me uh, introduce myself. He said, uh, my name is, is Benny. Benny Bootstraps is the name, and I'll be glad to tell you about our American Tifton celebration. They said, well, first tell us, sir, when did Mr. Tifton give you your million dollars? He said, say again? What did you say, a million dollars? 
you, you must be joking. I had to borrow $300 to pay for my Tifton presents. Well, then what is it all about? Well, you see, I'm not an expert by any means, believe me, but uh, it's all written down in a book about his life. Most people have one in their home. I must say I haven't read very much of it, but as I gather, it's, it's sort of a, a story about a man that made a great deal of money, and, uh, and you see, he gives the principles by which he did that, and if we will just read those principles, why, we too can get rich. We might even become millionaires. And they looked at one another in absolute astonishment, and they wondered how in the world could such a distortion of Tifton Day have come about? A do-it-yourself book? That's what it has degenerated into? They figured they must continue their investigation. They asked another gentleman. He said, excuse me, sir, I wonder if you could help us. We're trying to understand about your Tifton Day celebration. And uh, this fellow said, well, I'll be happy to explain it to you. Uh, my name is Tommy Tradition. Who are you? Well, we're both named Tifton. Tifton, <laughs> well, I bet you get a lot of kidding about that about this time of year. And they looked rather amazed at one another and said, well, um, I suppose you could say that. Now, Tifton, he said, I've t celebrated Tifton all my life. My parents celebrate. I used to put my, my Tifton stocking up on the mantel when I was young. And we sent out Tifton cards and got our Tifton morning presents. Oh, it's great fun. But, sir, when did you receive your million dollars from Mr. Tifton? Million dollars? What in the world? What in the world are you talking about? It's, you see, it's, it's, it's tradition. It's, well, I could just boil it all down and say it's, it's just tradition. That's all. He turned away, muttering something about strangers coming over here, questioning their precious traditions. But not willing to give up quite so quickly, they turned to the final gentleman and said, since he looked like he was dressed quite well, they figured he must be a real Tifton. And they said, uh, Mr. Tifton, uh, we're also Tiftons. I wonder if we could ask you a question. He said, my name's not Tifton, it's Mick Mythology. What can I do for you? They said, well, we're trying to understand this, this Tifton Day celebration. He said, you really don't understand it? They say, well, honestly, we don't think we do. Well, let me see if I can explain it to you. Though I certainly should be the last one to try to do that. Well, you see, it, it's said that there was this fellow that lived a long time ago somewhere far away, and he had a gift-giving propensity, and he gave all kinds of different gifts to people, you know, the kind of things that we continue to do today. It seemed to be a good idea. Now, of course, it's probably just a fable. There are, believe it or not, some people that actually believe he really lived. But with our modern advancements and scientific technology, we're reasonably convinced that he never really lived at all, but it's a nice idea. And so we just picked up on the idea and we've continued it. And they said, you really don't believe there ever was a Mr. Tifton? No, I don't believe it myself, but you know, who am I to question other people? If they want to believe it, it's up to them. It's a nice idea, as I said. And now our two friends are utterly and totally confused. And just at that moment, suddenly, there came a knocking at the door that was hardly able to be heard because of the raucous laughter and the sound of the beating of the drums and the music. And when it was repeated and still unanswered, they saw 
to their amazed eyes, the door opened and there was the perennial descendant of Michael Anthony, easily recognized by the bowler hat, the umbrella under the arm, and the briefcase with the million dollar cashier's check. And they said one to another, smashing, at least somebody at this party is going to discover what Tifton Day is really all about and someone is going to become a Tifton and understand. And Mr. Anthony stepped a little bit into the room and said, <clears throat> excuse me, please. And no one paid him any mind at all. They were going on with their laughing and drinking and dancing and they didn't even hear what he said. He stepped a little farther into the room and spoke even louder and said, I beg your pardon, but I have here with me, and a burst of laughter drowned his voice out and no one heard what he said. And so he finally went up and accosted a man near the door and said, excuse me, sir, but you see, I represent, hey, Mac, knock it off, will you? This is Tifton Eve. We don't do business on Tifton Eve. Ain't you got no respect? Come see me on Monday morning. Here, have a drink. Celebrate. It's Tifton Eve. And Mr. Anthony stood there with his briefcase and a cocktail in one hand, looking utterly dumbfounded and at length, he set the cocktail down on a table, and he turned, and he walked out the door as unnoticed as he was when he walked in. And nobody received the gift, but The celebration went on undisturbed. Well, there you have it, my friends, a modern parable of Christmas. And I wonder, do you understand the spiritual truth clothed in physical terms? I wonder how many of you that are weary and footsore from tromping through the malls for the last few weeks. I wonder how many of you have received the real gift. How many of you that have writer's cramp and a gluey taste in your mouth that you're sure, sure you'll never get rid of from sealing so many Christmas cards. I wonder how many of you have the gift. And I also wonder if there are some here who are so spiritually benighted as all of those folks at the party I described that you do not even know what the gift is. You remember our text which said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Now, what is that gift? You know, the tragedy is that here in modern America, founded by Christians, there are millions of Americans that haven't got the foggiest idea. They're just like those people staggering around in that party. Well, let me tell you, what it is, if you don't know. The scripture says, the gift of God is eternal life. That is the gift that Jesus Christ came into this world to bring. Have you received that gift? Do you know that if some pharmaceutical company came up with a pill that would guarantee people 200 years of healthful, youthful, vital life, there would be a line from New York to Los Angeles 
of people wanting to buy it. And Christ offers us eternal life, 200 billion quadrillions of trillions of centuries in a perfect, undying, amaranthine life freely in the fullness of youth and strength and health beyond anything that we've ever known in this life. What eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, or has ever entered into the mind of man, this is offered freely by Christ. And he paid for it himself on that lonely hill outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Christ by his own agony and suffering and blood, purchased that gift of everlasting life and offers it gratuitously to all of those that will place their trust in him, repenting of their sins and turning unto God in Jesus Christ, that they will receive the most glorious, marvelous, unspeakable gift imaginable, the gift of everlasting life. And I wonder how many who have just celebrated Christmas when Christ came down to bring us that gift don't even have that gift even among those here today. Do you? Have you repented of your sins and opened your heart for Christ to come in? To be the Lord and Savior and Master of your life, to give you a never-ending life? Jesus said, he that trusteth in me shall never die. And I'm happy to say to you that I will never die. Oh, this body will give out. But God has a new and more marvelous body by far, and I'm looking forward to that. Where there is no pain or suffering or sorrow or tears, when all things are forever made new. Do you have the gift of God, which is eternal life? Do you know that you have it? It is an axiom, my friends. If you have it, you know it. If you don't know it, you don't have it. How about you? Have you received that gift? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. And when he comes into our hearts, he brings with him the precious gift of everlasting life, a gift that he paid for with an infinite price. As the Creator died for the creature's sins, that he might grant to us eternal life, if we will, repenting of those sins, place our trust in him. He's standing at the door of some hearts right now and knocking. Will you, like those in our parable, ignore the knock? Or will you open the door and invite him into your life that you might receive the gift? If you don't, I suppose that all I can say to you is Mary Tifton. May we pray. Thank <clears throat> you.
Father, I pray that many will hear that still, small voice as a son of God offers to come into the stable of our lives to cleanse them, to renew them, and to grant unto them everlasting life. O oh God, may none be so blind so hardened as to not gladly welcome that visitor and receive the glorious, unspeakable gift of never-ending, everlasting life, saying, Come, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart right now, I am a sinner, unworthy and undeserving. Cleanse me, I pray, with your own precious blood. And grant unto me the forgiveness and the gift of everlasting life. I place my trust in you. I repent of my sins. In thy name, amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.